A video about a journey through Egypt and Jordan. Our trip to Egypt and Jordan almost never got off the ground as Heathrow in London was shut down by snow. Fortunately, at the last minute we found an alternative flight to Cairo through Athens. Our layover in Athens was profitable as food samples were available in the airport before we boarded our Egypt Air flight to Cairo. Our taxi ride from the airport to our hotel near Tahrir Square took about an hour as the traffic was heavy, but the scenes along the way were interesting. Cairo was a bustling city with some hints of the Arab Spring Revolution that was to come just after our trip ended. After checking into our hotel, we went out for supper in the local neighborhood. It was interesting to try apple flavored shisha before we had supper. We visited the Muhammad Ali Mosque which is situated in the citadel of Cairo and was completed in 1848. Its style was inspired by the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. To enter the mosque we had to remove our shoes and those in shorts or skirts had to don a white robe. Our visit to the perfume maker proved to be more interesting than it first seemed it would be. The perfume maker was able to not only mix up a wide variety of popular perfumes from basic ingredients, but also a sinus clearing potion that proved to be effective. The streets of Cairo were very busy with all manners of vehicles jostling to get to their destination, while brave pedestrians ventured out onto the busy streets lined with shops and roadside stands. We hired a cab to visit the ancient pyramid sites of Saqqara and Dashur, some 30 to 40 kilometers south of Cairo respectively. Our taxi driver listened to Islamic prayers on the radio and we were reluctant to interrupt his concentration which made for an uncomfortable trip. As we left Cairo we entered an area of farms where horses, donkeys and camels were still in widespread use. We arrived at Saqqara early in the morning and so were the only visitors. Saqqara served as the necropolis for the ancient Egyptian capital of Memphis. The dominant feature of Saqqara is the step pyramid of Dozier that was built during the 27th century BC. It is considered to be the first cut stone pyramidal tomb in Egypt and inspired the true pyramids that followed at Dashur. At 67 meters it is the sixth tall In the town of Deshur, we saw a disturbing scene of a horse struggling to pull an overloaded trailer of bricks. Oh, he drives so slow. Look at the horse trying to pull that big, heavy load of bricks. Oh, poor baby. Oh, 
that's mean. The most visited pyramids at Deshur are the Bent Pyramid. Gave us a camel ride. Oh. Lean back. Look out. You have a strong. Lean back. Lean back. Strong. No problem. No problem. No problem. Okay. The corner. The corner. Come back, my brother. Let's go. 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 After a tip, everyone was happy with our visit. Leaving the Bent Pyramid, we visited the Red Pyramid, which was the first true pyramid. And at 104 meters, it is the third tallest Egyptian pyramid. It was built after the Bent Pyramid and adopted a more conservative and safer angle than the former. We were able to enter into the burial chambers of the Red Pyramid, which are located deep within its bowels. Point up to the ceiling like you're doing something. Oh yeah, I see it. I didn't see the ceiling before. A narrow shaft took us down to the huge chambers with their corbelled ceilings. The floor of the burial chamber had been broken up by tomb robbers searching for treasure. It was a relief to again breathe fresh air after exiting the pyramid. A visit to the interior of the Red Pyramid was more interesting than visiting the interior of the Pyramid of Menkare at Giza. Returning to Cairo, we passed by farmers bringing their vegetables to market in Cairo. Back in Cairo, we visited the Khan al Khalili Souk in the Islamic district. This old bazaar is one of Cairo's attractions for both tourists and Egyptians alike. Prayers were just ending at the mosque as we arrived at the souk. While the hustle and bustle of the souk was interesting, the most interesting scene was the actions of the police while we were sitting at our restaurant. Suddenly the police showed up and started carting away some tables and chairs from our restaurant that were located beyond an imaginary line in the square. It was heavy-handed police action such as this, which added to the tension in Egypt that boiled over during the Arab Spring. Are we okay? I think so, Donna. Scenes of everyday life in Cairo were always surprising. At one restaurant that we ate at, tourists could have a camel ride and play with a lion cub while outside the restaurant, Egyptians went about their business as they had for centuries.
We visited a papyrus shop and watched a fascinating demonstration of how papyrus is made. The shop was full of beautiful papyrus paintings, one of which we purchased. Finally, it was time to visit the pyramids of Giza. The We decided to take a supper cruise on the Nile to better see Cairo at night. Once aboard, the pre-supper entertainment consisted of whirling dervishes and a belly dancer accompanied by a band. While these were entertaining, most of the passengers were hungry and so started chanting for supper. It was akin to a mutiny on the Nile.
receiving supper and the unruly guests, we went up on deck and watched the lights of Cairo reflected in the Nile as they glided by. We left Cairo on the 14-hour overnight train to Aswan. We had a nice compartment and were even served an edible airplane-style supper. Outside of Cairo, the scenes passed by that could have been from centuries ago. Arriving in Aswan, we walked about the town, had an Egyptian pizza, and then went shopping for alcohol at a spirit merchant who was discreetly hidden away in this Islamic country. The view of the Nile River from our hotel room was wonderful as the river was filled with boats. The Nile cruise boats with their blue pools looked inviting on a hot day. However, given the choice between a cruise boat or a felucca, we preferred the slow pace of the felucca. We took a taxi and headed just south of Aswan to get a boat to the Philae Temple complex on Agila Island. At the harbour, we joined with another couple to haggle with a group of boatsmen for a boat ride to the island. Well, you want to go, this is your boat. The price which you want. Do you know the Bazarian price? The word fillet means the end. Hence, it set out the southern limit of the Egyptian empire in the time of the pharaohs. The temple complex on Agila Island was originally built on Philae Island. However, the construction of the Low Aswan Dam in 1902 caused the temple on Philae Island to be regularly flooded and partially submerged. Finally, in the 1960s, with the construction of the High Aswan Dam, UNESCO moved the temple complex to Agila Island, where it would no longer be drowned. On many of the Egyptian wall carvings, every figure in hieroglyphic text, except for that of Horus and his winged solar disk representation, have been meticulously scratched out by early Christian zealots. The temple complex includes buildings from the Pharaonic era, the Greco-Roman era and the Christian era. The columns of the temples were painted before the repetitive flooding washed the paint off. The main temple of Philae was dedicated to the goddess Isis, the wife of Osiris and mother of Horus.
We caught a ferry across the Nile River at Aswan to the western shore to visit a Nubian village by camel. The Nile River was abuzz with activity as felucas and cruise ships came and went. The wind-driven felucas were very pleasing, but not so the large cruise boats belching diesel fumes in their wake. As we approached the western shore, young boys, some on boards of styrofoam, paddled out to tourist felucas and sang for tips. Since it was approaching sunset, the sun dropped below the western hills and we were in the coolness of the shadows. Finally we arrived at the spot along the shore where our camels were awaiting us. With some difficulty we mounted up the camels and started our sojourn across the sands to the Nubian village. Well, he's got it all under control. Okay, now make something happen. Unfortunately, the camel handlers thought the faster we went, the better we would like it. However, trotting along was uncomfortable since we were not experienced camel riders. Finally, after an exciting downhill descent, we dismounted the camels with relief. Forward. Good. Oh, excellent. I mean. The descent down the final hill was a case of hanging on the saddle for dear life. It was after dark when we arrived at the house in the Nubian village, so the moon was clear overhead. The house had an open courtyard that was covered in sand and seemed like a Zen garden. The kids in the house viewed us with trepidation as they peeked out at us as we wandered about their fascinating house. We sat down on the ground for a communal meal of chicken with rice and pita bread before the entertainment started. Following the after supper entertainment we walked back down to the Nile to catch a ferry boat back to Aswan for a short stay in our hotel until we headed out to Abu Simbo. Finally it was time for our trip to the Pharaonic temples at Abu Simbo. We got up very early in the morning since our convoy, escorted by armed guards, departed at 03.45 a.m. for the four-hour drive across the desert to Abu Simbel. The visit to Abu Simbel was a highlight of our trip to Egypt. The Muslim graves at our start point were raised above the ground to clearly mark the place of burial. At 3.45 a.m. our convoy with its armed escorts left Aswan for Abu Simbel across the desert. Our bus had three decorative pyramids whose shape was reflected in the desert landscape. At sunrise we still had another hour to go to reach Abu Simbel. In the Abu Simbel parking lot we watched a bus take off the mirror of another bus while armed guards patrolled. The Abu Simbel temples were carved out of a mountainside near
The long bus ride back to Aswan proved excellent for sleeping. Nearing Aswan, we crossed over the Aswan Low Dam and had a good view of the Temple of Philae in the distance. Passing by a Coptic Orthodox Cathedral, one had to admire their tenacity staying in such a hostile environment. Boarding a Felucca, we left Aswan and headed downstream on the Nile towards the Temple of Kam Ombo. Everything on the Felucca was manual operation as these boats are little changed over the centuries. It was very relaxing sailing on the Felucca as it was a warm day so we could laze about on the mattresses that were spread out on the deck. The huge cruise boats dwarfed the Feluccas as they churned on by, however they had little appeal to us. Since the Felucca moved slowly along, we had almost limitless time to take in the passing scenery. The Felucca had no toilet, so we stopped along the riverbank when required. Many of the Feluccas are foreign owned, so have foreign flags and images on their sails. To get under the cable stayed road bridge across the Nile, Felucas lower the long yard mounting their lateen sail into the horizontal. To sail upstream against the current, Felucas frequently team up by lashing pairs of boats together side by side. Since the Felucas are pretty bare bones, we had a support boat with us where we would eat our meals along the shore. Curious locals would stop by to check if there were any freebies available. The crew had to be agile to sort out the problems high in the rigging. We had lots of time to view the passing scene along the Nile as we slowly sailed downstream. Since we were not making sufficient speed to reach our stop for the night, the support boat took us on the boat. We stopped along the shore for the night and had supper on the support boat, followed by dancing. As the moon rose over the Nile, we settled in for a very cold night on the deck of our felucca. Near dawn, a large cruise boat passed us by. With breakfast over, we made the short trip across the Nile to meet our bus to Kamambo. At Kamambo, rather than go into the temple, we decided to visit the nearby sugarcane fields. The fields were a hive of activity, with workers and donkeys working hard to harvest the cane, 
while in the distance we could see the dark smoke arising from the sugarcane processing factory. It's not an easy life for a donkey working in the sugarcane fields. Once out of the fields, the sugarcane was transported to the factory on a small railway. The Temple of Kamambo is situated right on the banks of the Nile, so the large cruise ships stop right at the temple, where their passengers can walk up the staircase to the temple entrance. This is the Ptolemaic Temple, having been built circa 150 BC. It features a temple dedicated to the crocodile god Sobek. Leaving Kalmambo, we headed north to the Temple of Edfu, which is another Ptolemaic temple, having been built in the same era as Kalmambo. Rather than go into the temple, we decided to walk through the neighborhood beside the temple. This proved very interesting. The temple's neighborhood is achronistic in appearance. From the neighborhood we could look down into the temple precinct with its pylon featuring defaced reliefs. Leaving Edfu we headed north to Luxor. Luxor was known as Thebes in ancient Egypt, where it was the great capital of Egypt during the New Kingdom, and was the glorious city of the Egyptian god Amun-Ra. Our hotel was beside the Avenue of the Sphinxes that leads to the Temple of Luxor in the center of the city. The Luxor Temple was founded during the reign of Pharaoh Amenhotep III in the 14th century BC. The missing Luxor obelisk has been standing in the Place de la Concorde in Paris since 1836. The 13th century mosque of Abu Hagag stands atop the ruins of a Coptic Christian church in the precincts of the ancient Luxor temple. We ate lunch at the McDonald's with a wonderful view of the Luxor temple. The reliefs on the pylons include the requisite one of the pharaoh at war in a chariot, crushing his insignificant enemies. During our visit to the tourist bazaar, we were ambushed by a spice merchant who ensured that we bought some spice whether we needed it or not. At night, the temple and the surrounding plaza were illuminated, highlighting the water lily shaped columns of the temple's hypo style hall. The souk for local people is where they can buy everything from clothing to fresh meat. We attended the Christmas Eve service at the Franciscan Catholic Church, during which we could not help but think of the suppression of the Christian minority in Egypt. After an interminably long lunch, we finally arrived at the Karnak Temple late in the afternoon. The temple is the largest ancient religious site in the world. 
since its building phase spanned the reign of some 30 pharaohs from about 2000 BC to 200 BC. The Avenue of Rams leads into the huge Temple of Amun-Re which once joined up with the Avenue of Sphinxes that leads into the Temple of Luxor. The Great Hypostyle Hall consists of 134 colossal papyrus-shaped columns, with the largest being 22 meters tall and 3.5 meters in diameter, so large that we needed 9 people to encircle such a column. The hall was featured in the James Bond movie The Spy Who Loved Me and the Transformers movie Revenge of the Fallen. In ancient times the columns were wonderfully painted and amazingly there is still some paint on the top of the columns and on the underside of the roof beams. The feral cartouches on the roof beams are partially defaced as a result of the changing political fortunes in ancient Egypt. There are walls on which the erect pharaoh appears to be in an ancient Viagra ad which is close to the truth as the pharaoh is making an offer to men, the fertility god. He's still waiting for a high five. <laughs> 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 <Philip> waiting. <laughs> On some walls are the names of towns in the Middle East conquered by the pharaoh written inside the bodies of bound prisoners. We left the amazing Karnak temple in the post-sunset gloom and took a kalash back to our Luxor hotel. At 5 a.m. we left Luxor for the launch site of our hot air balloon ride, which is across the Nile on the west bank. The flight took us past several of the great buildings of ancient Thebes, including the Temple of Hatshepsut and the mortuary temples of pharaohs Ramses II and III. Woo! Take video, Ma! Good morning, everybody! Everybody at first time fly? Yeah! Me too! I hope so. Let's go, Now you can see how she suit them or how she can suit.
Oh, you see it, Donna? That shoes up. That shoes up right over there. Oh, no, you're see right where I'm pointing. Yeah. And you can see at, at, at the corner of the mound, the hatch of suit. Anubis, the jackal headed dog, yeah, the jackal headed uh, god. Everybody happy now? Yep. Okay. Passing over the Ramesseum and the Colossi of Memnon statues, the scale of these monuments was very evident given how small the people near them looked in comparison. Now everybody fly 2,500 feet now. 2,500 feet. <laughs> While our balloon ride was excellent, we knew that the safety record of these balloons is poor, with several crashes including the deadliest ballooning disaster in history, which killed 19 of 21 passengers in 2013. <laughs> Still going. They meant that. that. When you did it before, was it worth it? Or was it pretty soon? Yes. <laughs> 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 Running over there to help. We followed up the balloon ride with a short donkey ride, which proved to be very amusing both for us and anyone watching us. Do a handstand. Dismounting from the donkeys, it was time to visit the Valley of the Kings, which for a period of some 500 years from the 16th to 11th century BC, was where the tombs were constructed for the pharaohs and the powerful nobles after the pyramids fell out of fashion a thousand years prior. Our ticket to the valley allowed us to enter three tombs, where we saw huge sarcophagi and beautifully painted walls and ceilings. We skipped paying extra and lining up to see the famous tomb of Tutankhamun. The tombs are carved into the valley sides and floors. The tomb entrances are discreet, but that did not stop ancient tomb robbers from looting them when the state needed the treasures held within. Leaving the Valley of the Kings, we made the short drive to see the Mortuary Temple of Hatshepsut. 
Hatshepsut was a female pharaoh who reigned for about 21 years around 1500 BC. An expedition by boat to the land of Punt, which is thought to be near northern Somalia, was ordered by Hatshepsut, and it is commemorated by reliefs on the temple walls. Some of these reliefs still retain the color from ancient times. The Colossi of Memnon are two massive stone statues of Pharaoh Amenhotep III that have stood near Thebes for the past 3400 years since 1350 BC. The return boat trip back across the Nile to Luxor afforded us an excellent view of the Temple of Luxor. We took a 10-hour train ride back to Cairo before heading east to the St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai Desert. Once out of Cairo and approaching the Sinai, we passed by a number of Egyptian army bases with monuments displaying old Russian military equipment that was used in Egypt's wars with Israel. Unfortunately, we passed under the Suez Canal in a tunnel, so it was difficult to see the canal, and surprisingly, there was no viewing area to stop and look at the famous canal. We pass by more army bases in the heavily militarized Sinai. The country that we passed through was arid but starkly beautiful as we came into the multicolored hills where shepherds tended their flocks as they have done for thousands of years. Our hotel near the St. Catherine Monastery had an interesting bazaar where we bought some hookah pipes. Since our goal was to see sunrise from the 7500 foot summit of Mount Sinai, we were up at midnight and started hiking at 1.20 a.m. It was very dark on the hike up to the summit with the added danger of being hit by camels bearing tourists that pushed close past us in the dark. Well before sunrise we arrived on the summit but it started to rain hard and we were taken by surprise as it was in the desert. Without our raincoats we soon became cold and so rented a blanket and huddled outside the temple of Elijah on the summit. As it was clear we would not be seeing a sunrise given the Donna. rain, we left the summit and headed down to the St. Catherine Monastery. On our way down, the sun finally poked through the clouds, but it was well after sunrise. We were passed by a steady stream of empty camels heading back down, but at least we could see the scenery that we had missed hiking in the dark.
Finally, we arrived outside the impressive walls of the St. Catherine Monastery. The monastery is an Eastern Orthodox one established in the 6th century AD and contains the site where Moses saw the burning bushes God called him to go to see the Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Purportedly, the bush seen by Moses is still living on the monastery's grounds. Leaving St. Catherine, we drove through the desert to a resort near Nuevo on the Gulf of Aqaba. From the resort's beach, we could look across the Gulf and see Saudi Arabia. There was decent snorkeling available right off the beach at the resort. From the port at Nueva, we plan to take the ferry up the Gulf to the port at Aqaba in Jordan. The ferry arrived hours late and unloaded quickly, so we expected a rapid loading and departure. Unfortunately, the rapid loading and departure that we expected did not happen as the dispute arose over which trucks would be loaded aboard the ferry. The dispute escalated with the truckers blocking the ferry's loading ramp with their trucks. Finally, some army personnel arrived armed with AK-47s and the dispute was resolved, allowing us to finally sail away. After an eight-hour ferry trip, we docked in Aqaba, cleared immigration, and then drove down to our hotel. In the morning from our hotel, we could look out over the Gulf and see Israel in the distance, while below we watched a tourist riding a camel through the streets. 
Since Aqaba is a duty-free shopping zone, we were able to buy alcohol at a very reasonable price for use later at Wadi Rum. It was but a short drive from Aqaba to Wadi Rum through which Colonel T.E. Lawrence, a.k.a. Lawrence of Arabia, passed through several times during the Arab Revolt of 1917-1918 against the rule of the Ottoman Turks. In fact, much of the 1962 film Lawrence of Arabia was filmed on location in Wadi Rum. We stayed in a goat hair tent at one of the several desert camps in Wadi Rum. A ride in the back of a 4x4 truck through Wadi Rum was positively rewarding. After speeding across the desert floor, we stopped to give a go at ascending a steep sand slope. It was quite a challenge to make progress up the slope given the deep desert sand. Some 2,000 years ago, the Nabataeans left petroglyphs of their camel caravans etched into their ancient rock varnish. As the sky was partly cloudy, the sun painted the hills in a variety of light and shadows. There were camels for hire at a beautiful natural arch. A huge natural bridge provided an awesome passageway across the desert floor. Unfortunately, an idiot in a Hummer drove up the rock and we could hear the loud cracking of friable rock under his tires. We stopped at one of the several springs in Wadi Rum where the ancient Nabataeans had cut rock channels to divert precious water into cisterns that acted as water holes for their thirsty caravans. While the play of the sun on the desert hills was beautiful, the temperature noticeably dropped as sunset approached. 
fortunately we were able to gather up dead plants that would serve as a fuel to both heat up our cells and our tea. After sundown, it was a cold return ride back to camp in the back of the truck. New Year's Eve brought music, dancing, shisha, candies, and even desert fireworks. After a cold night, an early morning walk around the area near the camp was rewarding as the scenery
past the local scene and then have a Turkish bath before supper and retiring to the cave bar built in a 2,000 year old Nabataean rock tomb. In the morning it was time to visit Jordan's most visited tourist attraction, the amazing ancient city of Petra founded in 312 BC by the Nabataeans. A five mile hike through Petra took us past many of its main sites. Petra is entered by a one kilometer long seek or cleft that has a Nab We could overlook the tombs and the cliffs across the valley and the sheep on the valley floor below. At the bottom of the trail is the pretty garden hall with its twin columns.
We passed by a number of interesting tombs until the valley floor opened up and we could see the urn tomb in the distance. The Roman colonnaded street and the Themenos Gate are evidence that Petra was absorbed into the Roman Empire in 106 AD. The final objective of our visit was to make a climb up to the monastery, which is Petra's largest monument dating from the 1st century BC. On the 800 step trail up to the monastery we encountered interesting scenes including souvenir vendors and donkeys toiling up the steps with tourists clinging to their backs. After toiling up the steps it was exciting to catch a glimpse of the backside of the giant 10 meter high urn atop the monastery. The monastery's facade is so big that it is hard to believe. The doorway alone is taller than a house. At first glance the facade looks much like the treasuries, but it is less ornate. The name monastery is a misnomer as it was almost certainly a temple, possibly dedicated to the Nabataean king Obidus I, who reigned in the first century BC and was posthumously deified. The flat plaza in front of the monastery is not natural. It was leveled to contain the crowds that gathered there for religious ceremonies. The long walk back to the parking lot took us past lots of interesting scenes of camels, Nabataean tombs, and the Roman-inspired amphitheater. Our visit to Petra was most rewarding and worth the long hike around the site in the hot sun. Our journey next took us from Petra to Amman, passing by the Crusader castles, the Dead Sea, and the biblical site of Mount Nebo. The Crusades were military campaigns in the Middle Ages that sought to restore Christian access to the Christian holy places then controlled by the Moslems. The Crack de Montréal castle was built in 1115 by King Baldwin I of Jerusalem, but the castle fell to Saladin in 1189 after a two-year siege. The Crack de Mobit castle was built in the 1140s by the King of Jerusalem. It was one of the largest crusader castles in the Middle East and was able to control the local populace as well as the trade routes from Damascus to Egypt and Mecca. The castle is located on a hill spur with a deep moat that isolates it from the remainder of the hill, while the rest of the castle is protected by steep slopes covered by a glacis. The castle fell to Saladin in 1189 after a protracted siege following the disastrous Battle of Hatton in 1187, where the Muslim armies under Saladin captured or killed the vast majority of the Crusader forces. Leaving the castle, we headed down towards the lowest elevation on Earth, the Dead Sea. 
The Dead Sea is a salt lake between Jordan and Israel. Its twin claims to fame are firstly that its surface at 427 meters below sea level is the lowest elevation on land, and secondly that its salinity of 34% makes it one of the saltiest bodies of water in the world. Because of its low elevation, the waters from the Jordan rivers flow in, but nothing flows out. The density of the Dead Sea salt water is so great that anyone can easily float on its surface, and its black mud is purported to have therapeutic properties. Fly back and float! Float! Float, damn you! Wave! Wave! There you go. Floating in the Dead Sea is great fun given the alien experience of being able to float without any effort. Your arms are. I don't know, 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 too bad you didn't bring a paper, Thomas. You could read the paper. <laughs> okay. The Dead Sea is 50 kilometers long and 15 kilometers wide at its widest point. Leaving the Dead Sea, we drove up to Mount Nebo where Moses died. Two popes visited Mount Nebo, namely Pope John Paul II in 2000 and Pope Benedict XVI in 2009. During his visit, Pope John Paul II planted an olive tree beside the Byzantine chapel as a symbol of peace. Mount Nebo is mentioned in the Bible as the place where Moses was granted a view of the promised land that he would never enter. The wonderful ancient mosaics in the Byzantine Basilica on Mount Nebo date to 531 AD. Leaving Mount Nebo, we made the short drive to the city of Madaba that is mentioned in the Old Testament of the Bible. Madaba is known as the City of Mosaics due to the number of ancient mosaics found there, including the 6th century mosaic map of Jerusalem located in the apse of the Greek Orthodox Basilica of St. George. The mosaic map of Jerusalem dating from 560 AD contains the earliest extant representation of Jerusalem after its destruction and rebuilding in 70 AD. The map may have served to orientate Christian pilgrims to the Holy Land. Leaving Madaba, we drove to Amman, the capital city of Jordan. The Citadel of Amman sits on the highest hill in the city, which makes it an excellent defensive position. Hence it has been occupied for some 7,000 years. Occupiers of this site have included the Romans, the Byzantines and the Arabs, all of which have left their mark on the site. The view out over Amman from the Citadel is outstanding and includes the Roman Amphitheatre built about 150 AD and it is still in use today. The Roman Temple of Hercules was built during the reign of Marcus Aurelius in about 150 AD. The Amman Citadel is also the site of the Jordan Archaeological Museum, which is home to an interesting collection of artifacts from Jordanian historic sites. 
Artifacts include examples of the Dead Sea Scrolls found at Qumran in 1952. We found Amman to be an excellent place to unwind after our trip through Egypt and Jordan. Unfortunately, our return trip home like our trip to Cairo involved three flights, taking us from Jordan to Switzerland and then to Washington DC and finally home. Die.